All right, so yeah, thank you again, um, Colleen Sinet Jennings for taking this time to speak to me. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk to you about was if you could speak to some of your early experiences with Shakespeare. Like, when did you first encounter him? Do you remember some of those reactions? I think you said in interviews that um, Hamlet had initially turned you off, right? Well, um, I was introduced to uh, Shakespeare uh, in Nigeria. My family um, uh, took us all to Nigeria to live in 1965. Oh, wow. And I and I went to I attended an international school, and the headmaster was English, uh, you know, British. But we had teachers from all over the world and so forth. But the school had a tradition, as many British schools do, of a, uh, a Shakespeare annually. So um, I saw him, and, and he was so awesome because he picked plays that usually high schools avoid, like Merchant of Venice. Um, uh, what were the other, um, uh, what was the other one that he did? But he, he did not only Unusual Shakespeare, but he did Brecht. You know, he did um, high school? Chalk Circle at, at an international high school in Nigeria in 1965. So oh, he wow. was way ahead of his time. <laughs> and I had him for English. And he had picked, uh, this is, I was uh, the equivalent of 10th grade, and he picked As You Like It, and we got, you know, we handed out the books, and he had us read it aloud, which was awesome. What was interesting was, I had never read Shakespeare, much less read it aloud. All my Nigerian colleagues had, of course, because Nigeria was only recently independent. So they had read and, and seen and performed Shakespeare in the second, third, fourth, fifth grade. And of course, my English colleagues, uh, you know, my um, uh, British classmates had. So I was really sort of um, the lone person who had never sort of experienced Shakespeare. But the, the, the most important thing to me was he expected us to understand it. So we did. So I didn't have any of the, oh my God, it's Shakespeare and everything. He handed it out like, you know, everybody cool with this and everybody was cool with it. So I had to act cool with it. And because he had us reading it aloud, I came to understand it. And I got to play Rosalind and my big crush was Orlando. And, you know, it, it couldn't have been better. Um, so that was my first experience, which was a wonderfully positive experience. Then unfortunately I got to college and had a miserable experience. I had a, a, a very boring pedantic Shakespeare teacher who, you know, he, he literally droned on and on and on like oh. this. We never read anything aloud. And um, uh, we, we read Othello and that was the play that, it, both Othello and Hamlet turned me off, but Othello really turned me off. I was, um, I was embarrassed by this character. Here I am, the only black person in this very white class at Bennington. And I was embarrassed by him and his, what I felt was stupidity and naivete and his, um, you know, he, he must have been stupid and naive for Iago to have tricked him. And, you know, um, this is the 1960s also, black power, and he's, he's pining after this white woman and he and I weren't making it at all. <laughs> and um, my next encounter, well, actually, the University of Ibadan in Nigeria did a production of Othello. So, it was so interesting to be on a university campus and have the students do this production. And in Nigeria, when you go to see a play or a movie or whatever, it's part of the culture that you respond. So people were calling out and everything during the play. And when Othello saying, you know, one more kiss, they say, ah, kiss her again. You're going to kill her, kiss her again. So it was a rousing sort of semi-comic, you know, so that was interesting and confusing and, and fun. Then um, really my next, because uh, we didn't do any Shakespeare at Bennington. Again, these this is the late 60s, early 70s, and everybody's doing European exper experimental plays. I did a lot of Grotowski. I did a lot of obscure European uh, nihilists, but I didn't do any Shakespeare. Then I got to the Folger. I've been working at the Folger sort of forever. And during the O.J. Simpson trial, that particular um, institute, one of the plays we had on the docket to read was Othello. And people kept talking about the O.J. Simpson Institute, likening it to Othello, which made me insane, uh, mainly because Desdemona was not a freaking cocktail waitress. Desdemona 
was was uh, you know uh, not only daughter of the Duke, but she was so you know when when Othello talks about you know she's she's my partner and my companion, I envisioned her as you know a co-strategist, a woman ready to go to war. You know, so so that pissed me off, and that's one of the reasons I wrote playing Juliet casting Othello. Quite quite frankly, to wrestle to wrestle with the plays. Whenever I remake a play, it's because I'm wrestling with it. I'm trying to figure out where I fit, where the openings, where I can examine some of the problems and so forth. So um, I would say it's through through that that I finally got courage. My, my last Shakespeare at AU was Othello and Abby, that play beat me up. I was having PSD, uh, PTSD for months after I directed that. It is... It, it, it is such a brutal play on so many levels. I cast two Yagos that work simultaneously, one male, one female. Mm -hmm. one, one reason being, I believe Yago has a feminine and a masculine side, but also because my play, my play had a semi-contemporary setting. And I said, we don't understand the power of words anymore. We're such a visual culture. And so, to have two Iagos pounding away, one real, literally on each shoulder, I thought was a much more effective way of showing how this man who is smart and strong and principled just gets overwhelmed by these forces. One night I come into rehearsal and my female Iago is over in the corner crying. And I went over to her, I said, Emma, what's the matter? She says, Kathleen, this play is so brutal. And it, you know, it. I did more processing with the actors on this particular show than ever before. And I'm one for, you know, it's educational theater, so we need to know what we're about. But we did a lot of trust exercises, a lot of intimacy coaching, a lot of talking. About, it, it, it is so brutal on so many levels, and race is just a small part of it. Um, so I'm glad I. I went through the various stages of shame, embarrassment, anger, and finally supplication. I realized, you know, as we were closing the show, I said, I will never refer to myself as a Shakespeare scholar. I'm a Shakespeare mm -hmm. student. This is probably related to what you've been talking about, but I know you've acted, you've directed, you've adapted, you've talked about using writing to grapple with these plays. Are there differences in how you feel like you respond to Shakespeare in each of these modes um, or how, how you, you learn about him in each of these kinds of modes of working with him? Well, well, all three modes uh, continue to build my reverence, humility and awe of of this person as a as a playwright as a as a student of psychology and sociology and falconry and everything else you could name how can how can one person chronicle human existence in a way that has such depth and such power how can one playwright i mean you know every single time I do the rude mechanicals scene, whether it's senior citizens or eight year olds, or it's a sure fire, knock down, drag out comic event. It's on the page, it's baked into the text. How many playwrights are able to do that? So, so it just increases my, as I said, humility. So when people say, oh, you're a Shakespeare scholar, I said, nah, 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 nah. Ellen Mackay is a Shakespeare scholar. I'm a Shakespeare student. Um, but I would say the purview is different. So as an actor, getting my body and my voice and my imagination and my full instrument up to speed so that I can embody that text, I don't even have to worry about emotions because if I do all that, the text takes you. As I tell people, it's like riding in a Mercedes. You know, you, you, if you do all your work, it, the text will take you. As a writer, the discoveries that you make in terms of how the script is, the, the text is structured and the, the wonderful um, uh, 
sense of how you can open doors and 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 find windows into the text almost at any point, you know. So um, it's no surprise that people are continue continue to adapt this and continue to find their own stories inside the text because it's it's limitless, you know, and it's porous. Uh, and that's in terms of the writing. Um, and then in terms of the directing, which for me has always been the hardest thing, because for me, excuse me, you're responsible for the most. Mm -hmm. You you are responsible for everything. And to be responsible for realizing a Shakespeare text, from everything to your actor's vocal health, to sight lines, to understanding the text, to making sure that it's action driven, to making sure that your, your actors are articulating enough for your audiences to understand them. To me, it, it, it's, it's, it's overwhelming, <laughs> it's overwhelming. So each experience is different. I feel so lucky that each has complemented the other in my life. I've been able to do all of those. Um, and I feel unbelievably blessed to have been in a situation to teach Shakespeare. Because in teaching Shakespeare, I have been a, a continual student. And, and helping my students discover the joy of performing Shakespeare is a high unlike any I've ever known, uh, anything I've ever known. Um, my, my Shakespeare finals were kind of legend because people, the text forced people to go places they'd never been before. And it was unbelievable. I had two of my shyest students, white male, black female, do the um, Anne Richard III uh, um, casket scene where he woos her over the casket. And they started, they started terrified. Their final performance was so sexy and so bold and the last thing Anne did was plant a great big fat kiss on Richard's mouth. Everybody went, ah. So if you, if when you open the door for, for, for students, they will take it to places you can't even imagine because the text is that vibrant and compelling. And, and again, this is a man who, who writes language that becomes an engine. If, if, you, if you give yourself to that language, what it will do to you is just amazing. So to have been able to guide people to that uh, has been just a joy. Yeah, I mean, playing Juliet, casting Othello, I think speaks to so many of these issues. I know you said that casting Othello in particular was kind of born from some of your own experiences grappling with Othello. Could you speak to any kind of specific moments or instances that may have informed that? Uh, playing Juliet came from an instance where um, a black female playwright friend of mine asked a, a white male playwright, uh, I'm sorry, a white male director to direct her play. And I knew both of them, they were both friends. And I got caught up in the problem that occurred. The, my, my black female friend who wrote the play had a very strong um, protagonist, heroine, who was drop dead gorgeous, smart, powerful, et cetera. And my white colleague who was the director cast a dark skin, heavy set woman in that role. And the playwright was incensed and kept telling me, she's not a beauty, she doesn't look like I wrote and so forth. And the white director was telling me, you know, she's uh, the playwright's so upset, but I think my actor is beautiful and gorgeous and so forth. So I'm hearing them each in an ear, you know? <laughs> and and the, the white, directors stuck to his guns and the, the black female playwright was very unhappy with the production. It was an unhappy circumstance. And, and worst of all, the protagonist, the heroine knew or got a sense that the playwright was unhappy with her doing the role. And it just, it just hurt on so many levels. So this idea of what is beauty 
Okay, this idea of when you have a play that speaks about beauty, 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 what does it mean for a woman of color to step into that role? And what does it mean when you bump into all that light, dark language that's in the play? Um, so I, I wanted to, I wanted to sort of challenge that and sort of get that out in the open and, and get that colorism mm -hmm. dynamic um, out in the open. Uh, and I actually had a, a rather um, aggressive uh, audience member one night after the play at the Folger corner me and say, uh, you know, light-skinned women are never loyal. And light-skinned, she's talking to me, oh, she was like right out of my play. <laughs> and then she started emailing me and stuff. It was almost like stalker stuff. But yeah, this this colorism thing is is so painful and so alive and so, and um, what, what's interesting is I've had more high schools do this play than professional productions. And in every instance, I've attended about three, many of them were local. And in every instance, the students said, oh yes, this goes on all the time. Black, uh, dark skinned girls versus light skinned girls. And uh, so it's, it's not going away. So that's what happened with that. But it was a one act and I had my little theater company and stuff. Then that particular year I was at the Folger and we studied a fellow during the OJ Simpson. So that's, and so I figured I'd, you know, now that I already had my theater company, I'd put them together in, in those two one acts. That makes a lot of sense. I, so you mentioned that crazy woman who approached you. What were audience reactions like more generally? Like I assume they were more positive overall, but I'm curious how people responded. People really loved the play. Mm -hmm. High school students really loved the play, which, oh God, I was in seventh heaven. Here's a wonderful story I'll tell you about that first production. You've seen her picture already. You've seen the picture of Desdemona, mm -hmm. Susan Linsky. Mm -hmm. So Susan was very new to Washington when she was cast in that play. She went on to do a lot of work in DC, but anyway, she was quite new to Washington. And the way Lisa Middleton directed it, they used the whole house. So when um, uh, Jimmy enters, he walked down the center aisle. Have you ever been to the Folger? I haven't. Okay, they have a, a center aisle okay. uh, that's very dramatic. It slopes down towards the stage and then you walk up onto the stage. So the director had Jimmy in his um, uh, uh, un you know, uniform with his little name, Jimmy, on it and so forth, looking sort of scruffy, walk down, uh, hang out, and then walk down the stage. Susan's dad had never seen her perform. He was a working class guy and he was very ambivalent about her role in the theater so forth. So she invited him to see her in this play. The night he was there, he was sitting on the aisle. And when Jimmy walked down the aisle, he tapped him. He said, no, 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 you can't come in. They're doing a show here. He thought he was a, <laughs> a handyman. Afterwards, she said to him, what, what, what did you like about the show? Who did you like? He loved Jimmy. Now, Susan confessed to me. She said, my dad is a racist. My dad doesn't have any black friends. And he said some things that have made me cringe. But to have him identify most with Jimmy meant so much to me tonight. You know, it was just, it was pretty amazing. <laughs> No, that's really powerful. I mean, it sounds like they were maybe coming from similar perspectives, but to be able to cross that, that boundary, yeah, that's amazing. Misfits, yeah. misfits, because I'm sure Susan's dad was worried about not understanding the language and being right. made to feel stupid, just like Jimmy. Right. No, that's so powerful that you were able to capture that. Wow. Um, so I guess we can talk a little more about Jimmy. I mean, he's so he's stepping into this role of Othello, of first time he's acting. Um, and as I said, we have been watching Keith Hamilton Cobb's American War as part of our class. Um, and he really talks about the pressure that he felt as a black actor, this kind of assumption everyone had that he was going, that he had played or he would play Othello. Um, and so I'm curious kind of how you came to have this be Jimmy's very first like acting role. Um, and then if you have thoughts more broadly about the kinds of expectations that we as a culture put on black, I guess white culture in particular, put on black actors, even with regard to Othello or more generally? Well, I, I wanted to accomplish two things. And one of the critics, if you can fi find Bob Mondello, M-O-N-D-E-L-O, -E he said, 
one of the joys of my play was the fact that you find yourself cheering for this guy who's never acted before, who's saying a fellow, who's speaking Shakespeare for the first time, when all along you know that this is a Shakespeare trained actor who has studied his craft and who knows exactly what he's doing. So I love that suspension of disbelief because that's what theater is. I, I love the, you know, obviously the uh, meta theatrical aspect of this. People love seeing backstage and what goes on. But I also wanted to make a point. Shakespeare is not solely the province of educated people. It's not solely the province of the British. It's not solely the province of people who are Folger subscribers. It belongs to everyone. And if you and if you allow people to just speak the text without correcting pronunciation, without they'll they'll discover it and figure out what it means. And that's exactly what Jimmy did. And Jimmy is my mouthpiece in the sense of erasing my guilt because I had hated Othello so much. In, in, um, in high school and in my early years of college, Jimmy really speaks up for who the other side of this man is. He's, he's a guy with no experience in love. He's, he's an innocent. He's a guy who, who has always, uh, um, who's smart as hell on the battlefield when he's under pressure, but in social circumstances, he's at a loss, you know? So, I wanted, I wanted to honor him and defend him and present another side of him, a, 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 um, a, a side that showed his humility. Um, it, it wrestle, I, I wrestled for years with why the play, and, and people have talked about this, why it's called Othello and not Iago. Um, Othello is, is the piece that's damaged. Othello is the person who ca- comes to the play pure and is soiled and tarnished and, and, and perishes because of the forces that converge on him. So I, I see him as our, as our best self. Um, so those are sort of so, some of the things that I was exploring in terms of writing that. Going forward to some of your more recent work, um, as I said, we have watched Deborah Ann Bird's Becoming Othello, which is a solo memoir show that she performs, kind of detailing her experiences growing up, um, as well as becoming a classical theater actress and taking on Othello herself. Um, I know you've recently kind of written this show, Queen's Girl, that was just performed in February, right? So that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, which I understand to be a series of solo memoir plays. Um, and so I'm curious to hear more about that. And also if there are ways in which your work with Shakespeare has informed or trickled down um, into some of your kind of non-Shakespeare directly associated works. Well, I always say that my work with Shakespeare has taught me how to read. Mm-hmm. I've been able to work with some of the most fabulous scholars on the planet. And one of the things that particularly the scholars who are involved with the Teaching Shakespeare Institute, which is what I'm involved with with the Folger, has taught me not only close reading, but they've taught me to look at the structure of the language. And, And in that structure is the whole action of the character. So I'm always, amused and in in worst case scenarios annoyed with people who do these big concept plays you know let's set it on a golf course or let's let's set uh, midsummer night's dream in an in a bank office or let's you don't need all those bells and whistles it can be really a, a, a a bare stage he forces you <clears throat> to go to the very limits of your imagination, to go to the very limits of expression. I think he forces you to be bold. So I wrote my first one woman semi autobiographical play, <clears throat> Queen's Girl in the World, on a dare. A friend told me, You should write your biography. You should. Write. I said, No, no, first of all, nobody's interested. 
And second of all, I don't write that way. I got a grant to go to a writer's retreat and I set out to show him I couldn't do it. That's how that play got written. I wrote the first one and discovered, and again, I think this is the Shakespeare influence, just as Touchstone and As You Like It walks out onto the stage and says, now we are in the Forest of Arden and the whole audience says, yep, I'm on board. I'm right there with you. I even see trees. You learn how a person's language, a person's utterance becomes reality on the stage. So when my character says, um, um, uh, I, I, I got my, my skate key and I can smell the, the, the metal in my hand and I can, people go there with her. You know, um, I had so many people say to me when she was playing multiple characters, it's like I saw three characters on the stage, but only one actor. Do you know, mm -hmm. Shakespeare reminds you that the mind is very um, elastic mm -hmm. and you can trick folks. It, it's conjuring, it's magical. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I had Shakespeare under my wings and, and sort of in my bones mm -hmm. as I was writing this contemporary piece and it gave me a certain measure of comfort in terms of using language to create certain things on stage. So I you know you've also done academic work comparing Shakespeare and other black theater artists. I know you did a workshop on Hamlet and King Hedley in 2006 that I believe also became a paper. And so I think in that paper, you compare the two plays thoroughly, but you also note that Wilson was not especially familiar with Shakespeare, um, but yet there's still kind of some of these these impulses that get shared. So I was wondering if you could speak to some of these broader impulses that you see in your own and in other Black theater artists' work that were either inspired by Shakespeare or kind of comparable, kind of picking up similar threads to him in notable ways. Well, because uh, what, what I referred to before in terms of Shakespeare's uncanny ability to put a range of human experiences on stage on su in such a visceral way that it makes sense to me that that great playwrights who follow him are related. Um, just as, as he was related to the other playwrights of his day and the playwrights who inspired him, um, as, as the great Kristen Linklater said, you have to remember that language is only the code we use to describe our human experiences. Mm. So when we're babies, we go, eh, 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 until we learn to say, I want that. Do you know? Mm -hmm. so, so, so the language of Wilson, because he also uses heightened language and big, big concepts, is, uh, you know, I find as compelling, as uh, driving, as um, complex as Shakespeare, but in a different cultural sense. Now, again, Wilson comes out of an oral culture. African-American culture is oral. So we, we, you know, writing things down came, you know, far second, third, we, we talked. And, and talk was part of a tremendous part of our cultural life and ritual and, and how you spoke um, uh, uh, not only uh, uh, reflected you, but your family and your ancestors in the same way. And I remind my students uh, that, that the relationship between um, Shakespeare and Wilson and the earliest really good hip hop rappers is that idea of what the power of language it is and its ability to express the whole cultural impulse. When I we used to teach Shakespeare at AU, I started with using um, pages from Jay-Z's book, Decoded, 
because I wanted to, the students to see how, one, one of the things that Jay-Z does is he decodes all of his hit songs. So he tells you, why did I say 99 problems and a bitch ain't one and not, all that kind of stuff. So my, my students are like, I can't believe you're using Jay-Z in a Shakespeare class. I said, cause it's the same thing. It's decoding human experience. Now in terms of Wilson, um, because he was a black nationalist, because he was a pan-Africanist, because he came out of the whole black power movement and he came out of a tradition of black poetry in the 60s and 70s that is fiercely centered in black culture. So to say I'm Shakespeare inspired or that would, that would be an anathema to him or any of the poets of that generation. Yet he, uh, Wilson, lived in the ether, lived in the same environment. So he had to encounter Shakespeare, whether willingly or not. And those impulses that are in Hamlet are in Headley, that, that odd mother-son relationship, you know, the sort of usurper, Claudius and, um, uh, forgotten his name, anyway, who, who comes in, the, the uh, fragile love interest, um, Ophelia and, uh, what's her name, Tanya, the parallels are too strong there. And of course, witchcraft in, in both of those uh, cultures. So whether you like it or not, I think if you are growing up in, in, in a Western culture or growing up in a culture that was colonized by the British on some level that seeps into your bones. Mm -hmm. And what I'm gonna say to these young Tisch students is this is your birthright. This is your birthright. And, and people of color all over the world have, have claimed this and built their foundation on this. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, once you decode Shakespeare, any contemporary text is a piece of cake. And, and actors who have done a lot of August Wilson will tell you, like Shakespeare, there's a cadence and a rhythm to it and a syntax such as it, it's so tightly structured that it's legend among Wilson actors that if you mess up a line, you have no choice but to go back to the top of the speech. You can't improvise and find your way back. So there are so many delicious parallels. Both Shakespeare and Wilson were poets before they were playwrights. This has been an absolute delight. Thank you so much for sharing all of your insight and wisdom. Well, I mean, not tell all of it, just the tip of it. But yeah. <laughs> well, you can tell I'm shy and I don't like to talk. So I hope I hope I managed to really answer your questions in a productive way. It's been really amazing. Thank you so much for, for all of it's, your openness and insight. Thank you. You're welcome, Abby. Take care. You as well. Thank you so all much. Bye-bye. Right.